Okay, so let me introduce myself really quick. Um, this is kind of a last minute thing, but I, uh, I'm here to talk about what is kind of a, a little bit of a joke. Um, you might have picked up on some of my sarcasm in my description and that sort of thing. Um, the, the kind of idea behind this talk is it's all about like self-hosting, like running like web services from your house uh, if you wanted to. Um, there will be some jokes and like some things that you really shouldn't do in production, but I think is fun anyways. Um, so I think we'll have a really fun time. So give me just a second to switch to my slides and we can actually get started. We'll just roll right into it. Okay. All right. I also have not practiced these slides all the way through, so be prepared for some slip ups and that sort of thing. Um, I think that the main thing that I wanna start with is a little bit of context around um, what kind of got me interested in this in the first place. So when I started my career in tech uh, as a software developer, I had all these like ideas and time back then for like side projects. And one thing that actually like always irked me is these side projects, I always wanted them to like end up online in some way, shape, or form. And there were some tools in the JavaScript community that were really cool, like Netlify and Vercel that made that kind of thing super simple. But it meant that like, I had to write JavaScript or like use their tech stack or build a static site when I was wanting to do like more dynamic things or have a database or, or host like someone else's application on my own thing. And so then I go to Amazon, um, AWS, and I like start specking out a, a virtual machine and a database server. And like the minimum is like 15 or 20 bucks a month. And that just upset me. Like I can't, I'm not gonna give Amazon that much money even though I pay for Prime. Um, and so <laughs> since then, it's kind of led me on this journey of basically trying to learn sysadmin and networking skills from scratch um, to try to get to the point where like I know how a lot more of it works. And I'm certainly not where I want to be, but I'm, I've, especially over the past few weeks, out of necessity in a lot of ways, um, kind of gone down that rabbit hole much deeper. Um, and I wanna share some of the cool things that I've learned, um, some of the tools that I've picked up. There's a huge list of them that I'm gonna go through. There's like 40 slides in here that we might not even be able to get through, through everything. Um, I also kinda wanna start things a little bit backwards with the demo at the beginning. <laughs> so uh, if you pull out your devices and go to social.sgf.dev, this is a Mastodon instance. Who here knows what Mastodon is? Got a couple of people? Okay, so for those of you who don't know, um, Mastodon is a open source piece of software that acts like a, a Twitter clone, if you will, like a microblogging platform. But what's really powerful about it is that when you go spin up an instance of Mastodon, every social, open source social media platform has this problem of like not having content and users and, and like being like its own little silo. And so Mastodon tries to decentralize it where these instances that are out on the internet, you can like follow users that are on other instances and these instances behind the scenes will actually share the content between each other so that you end up with like a feed of actual content. Um, and so this is kind of like the official launch of like an official-ish Springfield Devs Mastodon server that I intend to keep running for some time. Um, so right now it is like closed invite only um, because I'm not ready to like see what kind of filth the internet wants to put on this thing, because I'm not gonna be moderating it um, super, super closely, but there are a couple board members in the crowd who have admin accounts. Feel free to sign up and like test the thing and try to, try to break it. I would love for you to break it. Um, <laughs> I know, right? Well, I'm gonna ignore it for the rest of the presentation um, and just kind of let you all have some fun with it. Can we get our accounts approved first? Yes, so the board members are gonna be doing that in real time. So as you make accounts, um, uh, Tiffany and, and Chris both have admin accounts and they'll be ticking the boxes for us. Okay, what's up? Yes, you do have to refresh the browser, sorry, good point. Um, it'll like say that your account isn't approved, you'll kind of just need to refresh a few times until it, uh, until it shows up, but that should happen pretty quickly. Okay, here's my favorite part about this demo. You guys ready? That website is running on this box on the desk here. Uh, if I unplug it, you guys won't be able to visit the website anymore. Um, I'm not gonna do that, I'm gonna be very careful and like not touch the thing, because uh, I want you guys to be able to enjoy it. So I'm gonna try to take you on a journey that to some extent is like the, the things that I learned along the way that got me here, and 
Some of it's gonna be very intro and basic. That, like, the first half of this presentation is honestly like networking 101. So if you um, already know that stuff, feel free to abuse the server and have fun with the demo. Um, but for those of you who are kind of new to that thing, hopefully I can provide some explanations to some of these concepts that are like, at least to me, were extremely foreign and hard to understand and try to connect some dots. So let's start diving into that. Let's talk about network basics, networking basics. We're gonna start with this list that I forgot to update. Um, we're actually gonna only talk about the first four right now. Um, IP addresses, DNS, ports, and NAT. These are like fundamental concepts that allow the internet to work. And I promise things will end up kind of making a little bit more sense at the end. So let's start with IP addresses. The internet protocol. An IP address is a numeric label used to identify devices on a network. So here's an example address. Um, I won't dive too deep into the specifics about the format and like what all these numbers mean, but think of it maybe like a phone number, right? You can like pull out your phone, you can dial a specific number, and you will get connected to another device somewhere on the phone network. The internet and all computer networks fundamentally work the same way. Um, and I do want to kind of make a distinction a little bit. I'm gonna be saying these, these terms in like specific to a network, not inherently the wider internet because the concepts carry between the wider internet and local networks that like aren't connected to the wider internet. Um, the important thing to understand here that anytime there's a computer network involved and the de devices on that network want to communicate with one another, they are sending that communication to an IP address. So they're saying, hey, I have a packet of data, I wanna send it over to you, and you is this IP address, the same way that you need a phone number, right? Also, an important distinction here is that these IP addresses aren't inherently tied to your device in any permanent way. If you join a new network, you might get a different IP address. Um, and even if you're on the same network and like maybe your device just goes down and comes back online, that you might have a different IP address on that network. So just know that it doesn't mean the like that specific device globally forever, it's just like that device's session on the network, if you will. Okay, now let's talk about domain names or, the, or DNS. Um, so if you're not familiar with this, DNS is the system that allows computers to convert human readable names that are, are much more friendly to us into an IP address. So if you go to your browser and you type sgf.dev, by default, without DNS, your phone or tablet or whatever it has no way to actually connect to the server that is hosting that website. Um, and so the, the DNS system, it comes in to fix that by basically keeping a mapping of these human-friendly names, like sgf.dev, into these specific IP addresses. Um, a great way to think about it, back to that phone analogy, DNS is like having a phone book. Um, you know, you get a big, thick phone book that has every business's name to their phone number, and now you, you as the human don't have to remember the, the numbers. The computer can do that, or the phone book can do that. That's what DNS is doing for us. Um, I wanna make, this is kind of a technical note, but I will be mentioning these two things many times, um, I'm sure. So there's two big types of DNS records. When you're configuring, when you go purchase a domain name, where, wherever you purchase that domain name from, they typically give you a dashboard where you can change a whole bunch of settings about that domain, including what they call records, which are where's the domain pointing to or where are the subdomains pointing to, right? And there's two big types. There's an A record, um, which is basically what actually points to an IP address. The value of an A record will always be an IP address. Um, and then the other is a C name, short for canonical name, and those records can actually point to other domain names. And the DNS system as a whole will recursively query all of those DNS records until it finally gets to an IP address down at the end. But the fancy and, and nice thing about C names is that if an IP address changes, you don't have tons of records you might have to update uh, behind the scenes because you were pointing to a domain name in the first place. Okay, I'm flying through these. Hopefully this is making sense. Um, Ports. So you all may have seen this, especially if you've ever done any like local development, you'll see like in your browser, localhost colon 3000. Um, that colon 3000 is the port that your browser is connecting to. And ports, they're used to identify a specific protocol or application to communicate 
with on a specific device. I kind of left that last part out here. Um, a fairly good analogy that I use here is if you think about your IP address as pointing to an entire apartment building, the port helps you identify which apartment in that apartment building. So if we think about a server, a server might be hosting multiple different kinds of applications. It might be hosting an email delivery system and a website and um, an FTP server. Ports are how other devices, when they're communicating with that server, can identify which of those applications they want to talk to specifically. Some common ones, like you, there's lists of a whole bunch of these, uh, like HTTP traffic typically um, goes over port 80. Uh, HTTPS traffic that is secure goes over 443. Uh, SSH, if you're familiar with that, that's how you can shell into other, other machines that uses port 22. Wow, another typo. Um, <laughs> You can tell I was up late with these. One thing that is very interesting about ports that kind of blew my mind, um, when two devices are on a network and they want to communicate with one another, you don't just send a request to an IP address. You send a request to an IP address plus a port. And what's interesting is that request also has a reply to address so that the server knows how to get your data back to you. And that reply to also has an IP address and a port. So what's happening kind of behind the scenes, every time you like open up your browser and you go to sgf.dev, uh, I'm, I'm going to be full of shameless plugs like that tonight. <laughs> Get used to it. Um, what's happening is my browser is making a request to whatever IP address sgf.dev is at. It uses DNS to figure that out. But specifically, it's sending that request to port 80. And when it does that, it opens up a temporary port on my laptop or whatever device is requesting it maybe 4,500 or something. And then it's waiting for the response on that port. And so then the web server, when it processes everything, it's going to send that back. This is going to be very important in the next slide, NAT. So um, NAT, or network address translation, um, this is a system that I can't remember exactly when it was invented, but it was meant to solve, um, I think initially, don't quote me on this, uh, meant to solve the fact that like, we were creating more devices than there were possible IP addresses. Bas built into the spec, there is a limited number of IP addresses. The theoretical limit is like 4 billion, and there is like way more than 4 billion devices on the internet. Um, and so to solve this problem, along with probably plenty of other problems, it's a very handy tool, um, was NAT, Network Address Translation. So what NAT does is it allows an entire network that's like siloed off maybe even not connected to the internet inherently, to share a single IP address that is connected on a different network. And so as they're wanting to communicate with those other networks, aka the internet, they, they, they take turns using that IP address. And it makes it possible for these 500 devices on this corporate network to not all need their own IP address out on the public internet. Um, the fundamental way that this works, this is why the like reply to and port thing kind of blew my mind, is the uh, NAT device on a network that has the public IP address, what it's doing is in, in real time as traffic is going in and out, is it is rewriting the send to's, or sorry, it's rewriting the reply to addresses to be the one shared IP address plus like a random port temporarily. And then it keeps a mapping of the port that the device on the private network had selected for its reply to, and it stores that in a little database. And then when the real reply to comes back from the internet, it does a lookup to see like, okay, did any devices on my network recently make a request and I gave them this port? Okay, I did. Now I can funnel it and map it back to the different port and it finally ends up back on the device. That blew my mind. Now I kind of understand how NAT works. I hope that that explanation kind of, kind of helps you here, but the reason I bring it all up, I forgot to show the last one, is it's going to be very important to understanding the naive approach to getting rid of your virtual servers. Um, and to be clear, when I mean virtual servers, I mean like the thing you're paying Amazon for or DigitalOcean for or insert random host here. So the naive approach that you could take to try and get uh, this all working, which I did at one point, um, is you use a system called port forwarding. So port forwarding is a feature, it's an optional feature that your NAT device might have. And basically what that 
optional feature does is it opens up a common port that you might care about, like port 80, on the NAT device that is connected to the wider network, and it uh, takes the traffic that comes in, the requests that come in, and it, um, let me skip to the right point. Oh, I don't have a good description. Just gotta do it out loud. So when a request comes in, you will have, when you opened that port, you will have made a, an explicit definition to say, the incoming traffic for that port should be routed to this specific device on my network, right? So your NAT device is acting like the web server that has port 80 open, but then it forwards it to port 4000 on your tower that's sitting underneath your, your desk, right? Uh, and this would work, but it has some problems. Number one, it obviously needs to be supported by your NAT device. To maybe add a little bit of clarity around what a NAT device typically is on your home network, it's your router. It's the, the, the thing your internet service provider probably gave you. Um, also, internet service providers typically don't like this feature in the first place, and if they gave you a router, which is very common, they will typically disable you from even turning it on in the first place. Um, also, the really big problem is that if you're talking about residential internet, your internet service provider gives you zero guarantees that the IP address that your NAT device is holding onto is actually yours. If you lost power at your house and then came back online an hour later, your internet service provider might have given you a different IP address. And remember, we have to go enter these IP addresses into our DNS records, which actually connects our web applications to them. And that would mean that every time like, something drastic happened at our house, we'd have a ton of infrastructure to update. We might be down for a lot more than we, we wanted to be. So there's a fix for this. Um, it's called dynamic DNS. Um, what dynamic DNS does is that server that you actually have sitting at home, you would install some kind of agent on it. And that agent is constantly checking um, what your public IP address is of your NAT device, of your router. And if it ever detects a change, then it, that agent would be connected to some DNS system to automatically update that IP address for you. And so this does kind of mitigate the problem in a lot of ways. It means that as you, your IP, internet service provider gives you different IP addresses, you will automatically come back online um, as that agent detects it and updates things. So why do I call this the naive approach? I just said that it, it kind of works, right? Well, it works until it doesn't. Like, it might be blocked by your internet service provider in the first place. Um, the other thing that I really don't like about this one is that by default, if you don't do anything special, it's going to expose your home IP address to the wider internet. So if someone knows that you're hosting um, insertwebsitehere.com at your house, they may try to attack that. Your home network might become like literally a target for, for cyber attacks. Now, I'm gonna talk about Cloudflare a little bit later in the presentation. They, they would technically have kind of a solution that would protect you a little bit by trying to masquerade what your IP address is. But assuming you don't know about that, you're, you're putting yourself at risk, in my opinion. Um, also, this whole rigmarole that I'm talking about, where you're using port forwarding and dynamic DNS to like host a public website that is available to the internet, your internet service provider likely has terms of service that actually prevent you from doing this from a legal standpoint. They typically don't want you or allow you to host public websites. Um, they'll allow you to host like private things that aren't meant to be visited publicly in some instances, like let's say you have a, um, an application that hosts your private photo collection or something like that, like a Google Photos type thing. Um, they, they typically will have exceptions for that kind of stuff, and so this would work if that's all you really cared about. I did not care about that. I want like web scale stuff out of my uh, living room, guys. So um, I'm gonna introduce a handful of more networking concepts here. Please bear with me. We're like almost through all the networking stuff if this has been boring. Um, and then I'm gonna talk about how we can use some of these more advanced networking concepts to circumvent the IP internet service provider aspect of this so that they don't really even know that you're hosting anything publicly and they can't know. Um, not legal advice, <laughs> to be clear. There's a whole bunch of disclaimers at the end of this talk that I am gonna like emphasize. Okay, so back into topic land. I know these are coming at you fast. Um, the good news about me going through this really, really quickly 
is these slides are actually available on my website, so I've kind of like designed them as like a resource for you to flip through later um, to try to remind yourself from, of, of a lot of this stuff. So uh, the, there's kind of two concepts for one here. There's the concept of a proxy, and then in a second we'll talk about a reverse proxy. So a proxy is a server that forwards some internet traffic from a client onto the final destination. So if I have a proxy server over here and I'm like, I want to visit Facebook.com, instead of like reaching out to Facebook directly, I will say, hey, proxy server, can you go get Facebook.com for me? And then the proxy server makes that request. Um, and the advantage here is that it, it ends up hiding who the true client is from the server. From Facebook's point of view in this scenario, they didn't see who you were. They didn't see any IP addresses that, that gave you away. They just, they just saw the proxy server. Um, I only mention what a proxy is so that you can understand what a reverse proxy is, which is the thing we actually care about. A reverse proxy does the exact opposite. It is a server that takes incoming traffic from clients and forwards them onto another server behind the scenes on a private network. And so it, does, it has the exact opposite effect, or, or the inverse effect, um, that the proxy has in that it's hiding where the true server is from the client. The client doesn't know uh, where, the, where the server actually lives. Okay, this is the last one, maybe one of the more complicated ones, but VPNs. Who knows what a VPN is? Okay, um, you, you've probably seen this. I wanna talk about like, maybe what's happening underneath the hood just a little bit. So you've probably heard this description before because everyone raised their hand or something along these lines. A VPN creates a secure tunnel to some VPN server that all of your traffic flows to first. What I mean by that is like, it doesn't go anywhere else. It kind of is like the proxy scenario in that, in that regard in that every bit of traffic flows to the VPN server first and then from the VPN server flows out. The big difference between a VPN and a proxy for this definition is that all of it is encrypted. So if you have someone in the middle, like an internet service provider, they have no idea who you're really connecting to. They just see a bunch of encrypted garbage going to this one VPN server out on the internet somewhere. In practice, what this means that the packets um, that are, are being built by your, your computer, they're encrypted on your device using some shared key with the VPN server. They're sent to that VPN server, the VPN server then does the decryption and then forwards it on to its real destination. Kind of a recap of what I just said there. Here's the other part of a VPN that you may or may not know about. If you use, uh, who uses a VPN for work? Okay, there's, a, there's less hands there. Um, typically, why you're using a VPN at work is to allow, um, it's kind of in the name, virtual private network. When you are connecting to a VPN, even though you are physically separated and on different networks, any other device that is connected to that same VPN acts like it's on the exact same network as you. And that's why I kind of asked the work question because let's say you have a, an FTP server that you have to use for work, you may have to VPN when you're working from a coffee shop or something like that in order to interact with that because it's not available on the public internet. Okay, so what is the better way to do the self-hosting stuff at home and avoid paying Amazon all your money? your five dollars. <laughs> uh, well, you cheat a little bit and you pay for at least one virtual server. <laughs> so that, that, that is required here. Um, in my opinion, it's a worthy trade-off and hopefully I can convince you why. So this is a network diagram that I put together of exactly what is happening with uh, this machine right here. Um, the green boxes, those represent actual servers here. Um, raise your hand if you get the references. Okay, we got it. Those are rookie numbers, guys. <laughs> we got to get those numbers up. Go watch Silicon Valley, and all of those uh, references will make sense. Um, I am a diehard for that show, and I will always be. So basically, the the blue box on the left represents um, our like the the wider internet, and I have one virtual server out there. Uh, I, I've lovingly called it Middle Out, um, that is on the internet. I'm paying a uh, vulture. Um, they, I think, I think it's like 12 bucks a month or something like that. Um, and it has two pieces of software on there. 
Number one, it has a VPN. It's running as a VPN server that I can connect to. And then the other is it has this tool called Caddy. We'll talk about Caddy in a minute, but Caddy is a reverse proxy. And then all of that is ultimately behind Cloudflare. If I have some time, I'll talk about why that is kind of nice in a minute. But basically, if you, like you all hear what's happening when you connect to social.sgf.dev right now is your devices are hitting Cloudflare. Cloudflare passes that on to my server. Caddy then passes it on to this guy, which is lovingly named Not Hot Dog, through a VPN tunnel. Um, and what's great is like this was sitting at home hosting the same website, and when this device boots, it knows to just connect to that VPN server, which just automatically brings the website back online. And so I'm going to unplug this, and the site's going to go down for you all. I'm going to take this thing home and plug it back in, and we'll be back online, and hopefully with like I don't know six nines of uptime or something like that, because I can do that with residential internet. <laughs> um, I want to. The rest of this presentation is to talk about a bunch of those tools that are in there. I want to talk a little bit more about Caddy and like what it looks like to configure Caddy um, and the VPN system that I'm using, uh, WireGuard. I do want to take like a quick breather because I need some water and see if there's like any questions about the networking stuff that we went over and some of the concepts in there. Okay, we got one. We got a mic here. How much space is on the hard drive? How, how much space is on the hard drive? Oh, you're, good question. Good question. Um, one second. Definitely. So let me talk about this device for a little bit. So this is, um, this is what's called an Orange Pi 5. It's like a Raspberry Pi knockoff. Back when there was like a major shortage of Raspberry Pis, I, I bought one of these because I was super impressed with it. It's, a, it's got like an eight core ARM CPU and 16 gigs of RAM. <laughs> so this, it's kind of beefy for being so small. One of the main things that I liked about it though is I don't have to use an SD card. Um, if you're using single board computers like this, SD cards are notoriously bad if you're actually trying to store data. Because uh, if you're doing a lot of writes, like it can really mess with those things long term. I would lift it up, but I'm very scared to bump the power button and like ruin everything. Um, but on the bottom is a very short NVMe drive. Uh, I think it's a 256 gig drive, um, and I'm able to boot off of that. So this thing is actually running Ubuntu um, on that NVMe drive. I don't even have an SD card plugged in it at all. And I doubt we'll run out of storage for at least a few months. <laughs> yeah, it does. It does. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, everyone's just going to upload movies now to this thing. Amazing. Cool. Um, one thing that you'll also notice in here that I'm going to touch on later is I also have like a pretty slick backup solution. Because one of the things I have been worried about is um, I've been actually hosting some tools that we've been using to help organize uh, Springfield devs in the first place. And like that's actually data that I care about. Um, and so I'll kind of touch on that stuff uh, towards the end um, and kind of show you like a really cool incremental backup. So all those movies, I will never lose them. I promise you that. Um, they're being backed up somewhere. Are you worried at all about your residential internet throughput? That is an excellent question. Maybe. I have a three terabyte cap. Um, I also think that my virtual server has a one terabyte cap. So I will probably hit uh, Vulture's bandwidth limitations first. Even if it's not blocked by your ISP, it doesn't make it service Yes. <laughs> <laughs> not legal advice. Um, I could, like, I would certainly at risk of having my internet shut off if um, I'm not going to say out loud who my internet service provider is on a stream. Um, I told you guys this is going to be fun. OK. I mean, in general, though, like if you hit a usage cap that would alert them, you can move it to a paid server. Totally. Yep. Like, exactly. It's a proof concept. Yep. Right? Exactly. And I'll talk a little bit about the motivation of why I'm doing all of this. Um, it's it's not all set in stone yet, but we are getting a sponsor who is giving us rack space at the Springfield Underground, and we have a board member who's donating a, donating a server. So we will be in like a much more production scenario soon, but I've been like trying to figure out like how I want to configure all this software and set all that kind of stuff up uh, before we actually move to it. And I've been using my, my home internet for a while. Okay. Whew. How are we doing on time? Oh, wow. Flew through that. Um, I'm going to keep going. So let's talk about the server that I picked. Because um, if you do want to do this, not legal advice, but if you do, um, 
there's a couple of things that I looked for when I was trying to go pick the virtual server um, involved here. So number one, I wanted something that was very physically close to me to try to lower latency as much as possible because every single request that is being made to whatever I'm hosting has to go to that virtual server first and then back to my house. Um, so most of the hosting companies that you look at, they have these tools that they call looking glasses or, or the looking glass tool that lets you do um, like latency tests. They'll give you an IP address you can ping from your house and see what that looks like or you can give them an IP and they'll ping it and like give you the logs to see uh, what latency typically looks like. The server in question that I'm using is in Chicago. And I think it basically adds, the, the, the fastest request I've ever seen go through the whole thing end to end was 70 milliseconds, which is not that bad for like serving a web request in my opinion. Um, that thing out there on the internet, it does not need to be very fast though. It is not doing a ton of work. Um, it's mainly just being a middleman here, passing data back and forth between the real compute that you might have at home um, and, the, and the public internet. The other thing I would also highly recommend is if you go super cheap, the service provider typically won't give you an IPv4 address, and you will likely want that if you want something out on the, the wider internet. Um, IPv6, I wish it was, but it's not really ready yet. Um, you will find lots of users who won't be able to visit your stuff. And they'll typically, the, these, these hosting providers will typically give you those for free, um, but will charge extra for, for IPv4. Okay, so the next few slides here are basically kind of like a how-to guide of configuring WireGuard. So WireGuard is a peer-to-peer -peer VPN system. Um, if you care about this part, it actually ends up do, doing all of its communication over UDP, which I thought was super interesting, but it works and it's pretty fast. Um, Here's what it looks like to install it. It's a pretty, sim uh, these are all Ubuntu commands. So I'm assuming you're using Ubuntu. That's what I typically, typically use. Um, so you, you install it, assuming you have some kind of firewall. I'm not gonna, this is not a security talk. This is, this is honestly like the opposite of a security talk, I would say, um, in many ways. <laughs> so um, I'm assuming that if you're gonna go put something out on the, on the internet, you have a rough understanding of what a firewall is. The important piece here is that WireGuard needs to be opened to your firewall so that incoming connections can come through. Um, you then have to go in as a root user and generate a public and private key. And then you create a configuration file. I'm using Vim because I'm cool like that. I'm just kidding, I don't actually know how to use Vim. Um, and this is what one of those config files ends up looking like um, that you put in that uh, wg0.conf. You basically define the IP address on the virtual network that it's going to create. So this is me assigning an IP address so that you replace the X with some number. It doesn't really matter, especially if you're gonna have a low number of devices here. So I think for like the, the VPN server, I made it um, IP address two or something like that. One is typically reserved for, for other stuff. Um, and then make sure that the port that you specify here matches the port you opened up on your firewall and then you need to copy that private key you generated with this command. Uh, so what this command is doing is generating two files in this folder, one called private key, one called public key. You need to copy the private key and put it here. Um, and then you exit out of Vim, you um, save that file, you exit out of the super user mode, and then you run this enable wg-quick WG0, and the important piece here is WG0 has to match the name of your config file. And what that does is basically make it so that every time this system reboots, it is starting up WireGuard with that configuration file, and then the start command actually kicks it off the very first time. And so if you do all that, you now have a WireGuard VPN server. Then on whatever client, so this in this scenario would be Mr. Not Hot Dog over here, you, you run a similar setup, you install WireGuard, you uh, generate a public-private key, you add the config file. The difference here is the, the interface part looks very similar. Um, I think for some reason I had to specify the DNS server to use. Your mileage may vary with that thing. But the important thing is you, you copy your private key in there and then you also have to copy the public key from the server onto the client. And, and that's how it does this encrypted communication is they have a shared public-private key on either side. 
Um, and then you also make sure to set this endpoint to be the IP address of the real server. So I got that from you know, the, the Vulture dashboard or whatever where I configured the thing. Um, one note on the persistent keep alive. I don't know how helpful this is, but my assumption is that it, it would be helpful. It basically means that like every 10 seconds, um, this thing is sending at least one ping out to the, the server to make sure that it's still connected uh, and that it's always keeping some kind of connection open. Um, I'm assuming that that will kind of th keep things more consistent over time, but I haven't actually tested that. Let's see. And then similar thing, you exit out of the super user mode and you, um, you enable it and start it. There is one more step, and that is um, back on the server, you need to copy the public key you generated on the client back onto the server side. Um, and so you end up needing to stop the service temporarily, edit the config file, and add something that looks like this. Um, the allowed IPs thing is also kind of important. That has to match the IP address from here that you assign to the client. So in this case, I think this client is like number six on my network or something like that. And remember, these IP addresses that I'm entering here, those are the IPs on that virtual network, right? They're not publicly available IP addresses. It just means that when devices are connected to my network, they can connect to that thing. Okay. Continue. Okay. Um, so that's WireGuard. If you do that, you will successfully have a WireGuard connection between the two of them, um, between your, your client and your server. I briefly want to touch on Docker and Docker Compose because this was also a thing that kind of changed my life a little bit in this sysadmin space. Um, before I really learned how to use Docker, I was spinning up a server from scratch, installing tons of tools on it, um, and like really hoping that it never died because it would be a huge pain to restore um, if I ever did. And Docker, and specifically Docker Compose, has like changed that for me in a pretty big way because now I can end up writing a lot of the tools that I need to install on a machine as configuration or, or code instead of just a bunch of install commands. I wish I could do that with WireGuard, but sadly WireGuard needs to run at a much lower level in the system and can't run inside of Docker, which is why you got that whole bunch of commands. For those who don't know Docker, these next two slides are for you. They're like the highest level description I could give of them. If you do know Docker, maybe plug your ears because you're probably not going to like how I explain it. Um, <laughs> I do this every time with, uh, with, with Fred. I was so disappointed he wasn't here. Okay, um, if you've never heard of Docker, the concept is that it provides what is essentially a lightweight virtual machine that they call containers. Now, I have an asterisk here. Um, so if you didn't plug your ears, this is for you. I know they're not called virtual machines and that they're not really virtual machines in any way, but they're much easier to describe that way. And um, if the description upsets you, sorry, not sorry. Um, so if you're new to Docker, just think it's a virtual machine and you can kind of like have a mental model that you can work with there. But what's great about these is that there's a, there's a Docker command line tool that lets you like spin these things up and destroy them like really, really quickly and really, really easily. And then what makes that even more powerful is that the containers that you're creating, you typically are creating them from what's called an image. And that image is going to have all the dependencies and all the tools installed to run whatever application it is that you actually need to run. So a very clean example I can give. You need to go run a Postgres database, right? To go like configure that natively on a machine is not a super big deal, but it's going to involve installing a couple packages, configuring some settings to have the right defaults. Well, with Docker, I can typically string a single command together that has a, a Postgres container running. And when I'm done with it, I can delete it. And there was no like uninstall stuff left over that might be like corrupting future installs or any of that kind of thing. Um, Docker Compose brings Docker to a whole new level where instead of you writing all those commands to spin those containers up or, or destroy them afterwards, you instead can, can write that all in a config file where you actually maybe are working with multiple containers all at once. And that one config file could bring up an entire suite of these containers that work together to go accomplish something. Um, so for example, let's say you are running Mastodon. I have a at the end, if I have some time, um, I'll pull up the code base that I have like deployed to this with some Docker stuff, and you'll see that Mastodon requires a database, a caching server, uh, web servers, and like 
All of that, I just run a single command to create or delete all at once, uh, which is super, super powerful. The reason I gave you the whole Docker thing is I'm gonna talk about Caddy for a second, um, because Caddy was an important piece of that diagram. Um, because if I go back here, I really should have just duplicated the, the diagram, I'm sorry. Um, okay, if I go back here, um, you know, now we're in a scenario where like, not hot dog is connected to middle out through a VPN, but like that doesn't connect me to the wider internet. It doesn't put my website online necessarily. And so that's what caddy is for. So caddy is a reverse proxy. So, but, but even more importantly, it is a very easy to use reverse proxy. Who here has used Nginx before? Okay, who here has used caddy? Just, wow, okay, I'm about to blow your mind. Who has seen like a 50 plus line long Nginx config that properly does SSL? Like I'm sure you've seen that. Okay, um, blah, 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 Caddy does all the other stuff, but the important thing is your config files, I'm gonna skip ahead. This is my entire Caddy config file for this. And that does SSL for me and automatically renews the SSL for me. Um, this is a little bit of a misnomer. It's slightly more complicated in the real world because Mastodon is a little bit complicated and how you have to connect some dots. But if you were to do this in Nginx and get the exact same setup, it would probably be like 30, 40, 50 lines of code, um, as well as like some commands with let's encrypt or something like that to actually make it happen. So let me take a step back um, and talk about this file. So this is the Docker compose file for Caddy. Basically I'm, I'm, I'm de um, creating a service, which becomes the container called reverse proxy. I'm using the latest caddy image from Docker Hub. The, the people who make Docker, they contain this massive registry of all these images. Very similar to like how GitHub hosts code repositories, Docker Hub is hosting these images for you and you can just reference them and download them and spin them up uh, really easily. Um, this is a very important note I'll mention if you're doing um, self-hosting stuff like, like I'm trying to do here is this restart always. What this means is that if I kill the power to this device or whatever device is running this thing, when it gets power back and Docker spins up, it knows that it needs to actually spin this thing back up as well. Uh, so it keeps the thing always running. I don't have to manually go back into the server and, and ensure that the Docker thing is running. Next are, are ports, and, and this is another super powerful concept of Docker. When you're running your Docker containers, you can actually have these virtual networks behind the scenes that can, the containers can use to communicate with one another directly. But also, if you're actually trying to host things publicly, you probably want the, the ports behind the scenes to be bound to the real ports on the real device. Uh, and that's what these lines of code do. So they're binding port 80 inside that container, which remember, it's kind of like a virtual machine. Um, so it has its own ports and its own networking stack and all that kind of stuff. So this binds the, the host port 80 to the, the virtual uh, port 80 on the, inside the container, and it does that for a bunch of these other ones. Um, there's also this concept of volumes. Typically you need some data from the host to end up in the container for some reason. A big one with caddy would end up being that actual caddy file, um, the, the configuration file that I need it to follow, um, as well as maybe uh, some data that gets persisted if I delete the container and bring it back on. So that's what a bunch of this stuff is. This isn't, I'm not trying to make this a Docker talk, even though like I feel like I would to really explain all this. But just know that this makes installing caddy on any new server the same command every time, docker compose up dash D. And when I'm done with it or I wanna like remove it from that server, it's docker compose down. And that is the same for any application essentially which makes it really powerful uh, to me. It means that I don't have to know how to actually install Postgres on a machine. I just have to know what a Postgres config looks like in a, a Docker Compose file. Okay, you already saw the caddy file. I think the biggest thing that I'll call out to talk syntax here, what, I, what this is saying is any request that comes in on port 80 or, or 443 for social.sgf.dev, we're doing a reverse proxy to a specific IP address on our virtual private network. Remember, this, this uh, caddy config lives on my virtual server, the, the one I'm, I'm paying a few bucks a month for. And so this is the thing that ends up actually 
taking the application that's running on my device here and making it publicly available because I'm doing this reverse proxy thing to actually connect the dots. Okay, I, I wanna stop there for a second and open it up for questions. Okay, I'm stalling because I'm thirsty. I'm trying to like is he watching? Oh my gosh, that's so funny. Okay, cool. He also wants me to say he found a composer file and posted it in the Twitch chat that shows how to set up WireGuard in Docker. Interesting. I, I don't know how that would actually work. If you had a place to host a Docker image publicly, it would There we go. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Cool. <laughs> He's asking questions, raising <laughs> Sorry, I didn't raise my hand. You're good. Okay. So I think we have some time. Let's talk about backups for a second. This was another fun one um, that I came across. Like I was kind of blown away when I found out about this tool um, and was one of the motivations for me trying to put this together and kind of share it. Um, I'm actually gonna skip over this for a second. I'm gonna talk about the tool. I put the slides in the wrong order. So who here has heard of Rustic? Anyone know what this is? Okay, you guys are gonna think this is so cool, I think. So what Rustic is, is it's a tool for creating backups. Um, and uploading them somewhere. And that somewhere can actually be like anything. They support a whole bunch of drivers for uh, offloading it to Amazon S3 or Google Cloud Platform or Azure Blob Storage or even just SFTPing the files somewhere. The real power is that um, it supports these features here. It supports incremental backups with data deduplication. So what that means is let's say, um, Part of my backup process is I create a dump of my Postgres database. So I have a, a .SQL file that gets slowly bigger over time. Um, a naive backup tool would take a copy of that and save it somewhere and just kind of keep doing that and save separate copies of that same backup file over and over and over again. Well, what Restic does is it intelligently hashes the contents of the file and puts it into tons of little chunks and it knows to reuse chunks over time. So I only end up um, basically the, storing the, the totality of my data and its changes, not like my data duplicated a, tons of time, a bunch of times. So it ends up being a very efficient mechanism for, for um, creating the backups in the first place. The other thing that's great about it is every time you create a backup, you're creating a snapshot. And just like with Git, how you can roll back to any revision of that snapshot, you can also roll back um, your backup system to any revision. I can, if I'm taking an incremental backup every day, I can kind of go pick any day of the week and recreate what the data looked like when I took that backup. Um, and then also, it does all of this while ensuring that wherever it ends up putting your data, whether that's an S3 or an, F an SFTP server or any of that stuff, it encrypts all of it. So what that actually means is there's like a, a password you have to have um, for your backup, and if you ever lose that, you actually lose your backup. So make sure you store that in a really safe spot. Um, and then I mentioned already that it has several backends to upload backups to. Um, one that I am going to talk about is Backblaze. Um, Backblaze is super cheap storage. Um, I think it comes, my, my screenshot here says it comes to 0.6 cents a month per gigabyte, especially if you're not um, sending a lot of data. Um, a lot of these storage services, they'll let you store things for cheap, but if you're sending and receiving a lot of data, it gets a little bit more expensive. I think that their rates end up being reasonable as well. Um, but like, I, th I think I'm storing, with, I've been using it for like a month to back up everything and I haven't even gotten a bill yet because I, I haven't used enough. Uh, I'm sure I will after you all have had fun with that, <laughs> that Mastodon instance. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so here's what it looks like to end up setting up uh, Restic. Oh, here's all the, the things it supports uploading. Um, Backblaze, they call it out on their website as something that they specifically support, but they, they kind of don't. Backblaze just has an S3 compatible interface. That means that any tool that knows how to talk to S3 knows how to talk to Backblaze. Um, and so that's how you end up getting that support. Um, so here's what it looks like to install. Simple command. You need to create a handful of environment variables in the, the session that runs your Restic commands. So I typically have like a backup script that I work with that creates these environment variables. So the password, um, the access, the, it uses S3 terms here, so it expects an access key ID and a secret access key ID. And even though AWS is in the name, I got those values from Backblaze. Um, just like with Git, 
like the, the analogies to Git are kind of insane. RESTIC calls the backups that it's creating, it calls them repositories, just the same way that Git does. And so in many ways, you can actually just kind of think it's like version control for your backups and has a lot of the same concepts. Certainly not any of the branching and, and actually putting messages with things, but step one is you, commit, you, you initialize your repository. So if I was to go configure some stuff in Backblaze, they would end up giving me a URL along with the keys and I'd, push that into, I'd punch that into this command. And then from there, I run the backup command pointing at that same repository at some folder on my machine and then I can just run restore and that latest can be replaced with a snapshot ID and there's a way to go list out all of the snapshot IDs if I want to go to one that was created at a specific time. And so um, all of the, there's actually like a, a script that I'll show in just a second that basically um, it, it has to do some funky permission stuff because of Docker but it creates a database backup and puts all the images in the right place and then runs restic backup and I just have that set to do once every night. So every, every night I am saving all of the terrible content you all are adding onto that server. <laughs> but efficiently. <laughs> okay, uh, I think the last thing that I'll show is just the repository itself before I jump into some, some disclaimers. So if you're interested in the actual configuration that lives on this thing right now and is running this thing, um, SGF devs forward slash Mastodon, this is what it ends up looking like. So for instance, I can pull up that backup script um, these first two lines are kind of some hacky bash things. Um, I'm not a bash expert. I'm pretty sure ChatGPT gave me that. Um, <laughs> but it ensures like there's a consistent path here that I can reference and then I uh, load environment variables into this session. Um, and then I use some Docker commands. This is another great thing about Docker and Docker Compose is I can like execute commands that are like inside that container. So, if you know anything about Postgres, you typically need the pg dump command installed on some machine and it connects to a remote Postgres server to go dump the database into a backup file. Well, pg dump is actually already installed in a Postgres container that's running on this machine and I can basically do the equivalent of like shelling into the machine and just running that command there. And so I don't have to have pg dump installed on my host. Um, so this creates the backup and then this copies it out of Docker onto the host, and then I just run my backup command. Um, a restore is a little bit more complicated. Um, there's a directory that Mastodon is writing all the images to, and Docker notoriously has issues where the, the user that's running inside the Docker container is typically different than the user that's like interacting with things on the host. And so half of this script is just like, doing some, some garbage with permissions as I'm trying to restore files um, so that I don't run into like permission denied errors. But basically I, I spin the app down um, using Docker and then I um, use the restore command to, to basically reset this data folder which is where I have it write everything to. Um, and then I have to do a special chone command to make sure that when I spin the Docker stuff back up it doesn't hit uh, permission denied errors. I bring the database online, copy the backup file in, and then some more like shelling into the, the database container and uh, up reapplying that backup, like deleting the old database and, and doing the new one. It's been really fun as I've been messing with these is I'll like go run the command to take a backup, which will take seconds. I'll go do something in the app and then run the restore script and just see my action disappear because I've actually tested it and made sure that it all works. Uh, let's see, is there anything else interesting? If you want to see what it looks like to, to host a, a Mastodon instance, uh, this is what the Docker Compose file ends up looking like. Um, let me see if I can actually run this locally and just kind of give you an idea of what it looks like. Um, I think it's SGF devs, yeah. So if I just run Docker, I probably need to make sure I have Docker desktop running. <laughs> Okay, so Docker, I won't be able to actually visit the site because I haven't done any work to make this whole setup work in a local context. So right here, it, it would take longer if this was the very first time I ran it because it has to download a bunch of data from Docker Hub. But if we go look here, um, this is all those containers that are running. So there's a, a full-blown Redis instance in one of these containers, a Postgres database, there's this 
all the, these three, streaming, sidekick, and web, they're basically a duplicated copy of the exact same image. They ju each just run a different command and are responsible for something slightly different in the application. Uh, so if you don't know about the technical architecture of Mastodon, it's a Rails application. So web here is like actually serving up the, the website and what you interact with. Sidekick is doing background processing, which is a big part of what happens when the instances are passing your posts back and forth uh, between themselves. And then the streaming one is to get like real-time updates showing up in their UI where someone like sends you a message, you get like a notification ding right away, um, that kind of thing. But when I'm done with these, um, I can just say docker compose down and it's just deleting them off my machine entirely. Um, the really cool part is that as long as I have specified the volumes correctly, the actual data that I care about wasn't deleted um, when, I, when I killed everything. Um, and so I could run Docker Compose down on this machine right now and then spin it back up and nothing really would have gotten lost uh, unless it was something that happened to be sent right as I ran the command. Um, okay. Let's wrap up with a handful more slides, and then I'll open it up to some more questions. So, wrapping up, I do want to call out some things that, like, even I wouldn't venture to, to self-host, uh, because you are asking for more headache and, and investment than it really is worth. Uh, one that might be surprising, uh, Jason was asking me this a second ago, was hosting my own email server. Technically, I can do that. There is email software I could totally install on these servers and, and do mail delivery. The problem is, is every spammer in the world does that 24 hours a day, and every reputable mail system knows that. And so essentially, the entire email system has kind of been bogged down to a, a certain set of IP addresses that are kind of trusted. Um, and so really, if you're gonna be delivering emails, you want them to be delivered with a trusted IP so that they actually hit an inbox instead of a spam account by default. So I would highly recommend that you bite the bullet for email. Um, I am using a service uh, that Ryan, um, one of our board members recommended called MX Route. It's like $30 for three years of service. Um, and I can have unlimited email accounts with unlimited domains. The main thing is that if I end up having in, like inboxes that are storing emails, all those inboxes have to be less than 25 gigs of storage. Um, and then there are some limits about like how many emails I can deliver every day and, and that kind of thing. Um, anything touching payments. I'm gonna say that that's a bad idea right now. Don't, don't do that on your own hardware um, from your house because once again, this is like the opposite of a security talk. This is the part where I'm like a little bit more serious. Please don't do that. That would be a really bad idea, I think. Um, one that might be surprising is I probably wouldn't use this setup to host any game servers, like a Minecraft server or something like that, because game servers are gonna be very sensitive to latency. And you like, are automatically adding a decent amount of latency with this like back and forth, um, and you would probably be better off finding a way to host that in the cloud somewhere. Um, get one of your rich gamer friends to help you set one up, I'm sure. <laughs> Sure, they can do it. Um, and also most real world things. <laughs> like, like if you're talking about a production application that makes money, like, or even if it doesn't make money, um, if it's like useful to you and you don't want it to go down, probably don't do this. This is like really for fun in my opinion. Um, also the disclaimers, I'm gonna repeat this stuff. Do not come blame, like crying to me if your internet service provider shuts down your internet because they found out you were, uh, you were hosting websites at home. Um, also, be cool, don't tell mine. Um, <laughs> don't share this live stream with them. Um, also, just know that like doing this is inherently risky. Like you are like accepting a certain amount of risk here by connecting things that are typically in a private secured network to a not private secure network. Now, I feel like what I've done here is a fairly reasonably secure approach, but like I am sure that if there was a cybersecurity um, person who I was showing this all to, they might be like freaking out right now and like probably like, uh, I'm, I'm sure Chris over there is actually thinking some of that stuff. He's like. I think he did a pretty decent job actually. Okay, I, th I thought you were gonna say that you're already in this thing. And <laughs> <laughs> okay, good, yeah, good excuse, good excuse. Cool, all right, any other questions? Um, Chris is gonna walk around with the mic because I wanna make sure the questions end up on the recording.
Over there. So it's like all the Docker stuff is still kind of confusing to me. Mm -hmm. it, it took me a long time. It's something that I don't know how to do yet. You know? Is that on? No, I don't know. It doesn't sound like it. Yeah, can you flip the switch on it? OK, try that again. I don't know what yeah. I just said. Uh oh. Okay. Okay. So all the Docker stuff is still confusing to me, uh -huh. right? Because I don't know how to do that yet. Is that what I said? I don't know. Um, <laughs> now I forgot my question. <laughs> I'll tell you one thing that actually kind of helped me a lot. ChatGPT is excellent at generating these config files. Um, like, I don't memorize how to how most of the the like various options work or what they do. Um, and so typically when I, I'm after something specific, I can craft a pretty good chat GPT prompt that ends up like giving me exactly what I needed and it worked half the time. That makes sense. I mean, it can explain how things work to you. And then, yes, yeah, exactly. For that, yeah. Oh, you remembered. So if I understood right, if we had like all the information on your backup, we could host like a clone of like the Mastodons. Okay. Yes. I was making sure that I was understanding all that. Like it'll pick, it'll pull the backup from your, well, we don't, we need, we need to have your like secret key though. Yes. Okay. And um, there's also another restriction, which is that Mastodon, probably won't properly boot unless it's connected to the same domain name. Like they have some stuff in there to ensure that like you aren't actually running like a clone of someone else's server and claiming, claiming that kind of thing. But the reality is, is that theoretically I could smash this thing and go get a new one, clone this repository onto it and run that restore command and I'd be back up and running with no data loss. I just have to run through those setup steps again. Uh, no. <laughs> Oh, no, 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 you're, you're absolutely correct, which I have done. Um, so like, I did it in a simple way where uh, I loaded the database up on my machine, right? Like I was able to run a restore script on my, in my local environment and yep, there's all the data. Or uh, running, um, so if you do docker compose down dash V, it's a very dangerous command, but that deletes the volumes as well, which would delete any data. And that is like a true uninstall, if you will, of all the docker containers. This will survive a docker compose down dash V if I do the restore script first, after I try to bring things back up. Any other questions? In the back. I would just comment, if you do host this at home, put this device or whatever it is on a separate network. Very good point. That actually has been on my list of things to do. Um, is I, I would love to set up an actual like VLAN system. So if you don't know what VLANs are, they, they create these virtual networks on your same network that are like siloed off from one another. Um, and that is on my list to do. Please no one hack me until I get that one checked off. <laughs> oh, there we go, yes. Um, that actually reminds me, the honeypot thing you brought up reminded me of another tool that I did end up installing on the reverse proxy machine. Um, that seems like it's actually a really good idea. Has anyone ever heard of fail to ban? So, okay, this thing is great. It like is scanning like log files in real time on your system to like see if anyone's trying to like log in via SSH with common credentials or to access these certain files. And it'll just like put those IP addresses in timeout maybe indefinitely. And so you end up like just expelling a whole bunch of uh, traffic that you don't want in the first place. Very easy to set up and very much worth it. Kind of, yep. Any other questions? I was expecting like some sysadmins to tell me I did it all wrong, but like maybe I didn't. Thank you. Okay. Oh, uh, Jason. Okay, here okay, there it is. There it is. <laughs> I I'd be interested to hear how the Mastodon um, service treats you. Like yeah. maybe in ninety days or after you've got some active users. Curious to see what your experience is in terms of having to receive information from other instances and how much that fills up your storage yep. compared to us filling up your storage. Yeah, that's it. So I can actually give some stuff. And, and al ahead. also, like I'm participating in the server, but I don't have an account on the server. Um, right. Because of the nature of the service, you, yep. all of these are interconnected, just like I can email you even though I'm not on your email server. Right. So I think you described that a little bit, but if someone wants to see that, they can look at his Hello World post and he can see my reply from some other username at some other network. Yep. Yeah, 
So uh, to give, there's likely some maintenance I need to do because it is growing faster than I thought it would. The two days that it was running generated half a gig of data. But I'm, my guess is that I'm accidentally including some caching files in my backup. Um, so I, I haven't been monitoring actual system disk usage. That was the size of my backup that I was monitoring. Um, and so I could be doing something wrong there. But yeah, I may end up doing like a follow-up post after 90 days when this thing dies or something, or someone successfully hacks it, where um, I have some stats. I would not put, I, I migrated my real account to this thing. I probably shouldn't, but I wanted to for fun. Um, I would avoid doing that, honestly. Uh, I'll leave it up for as long as I can, but maybe don't uh, depend on it. Don't put all your photos there. Do you have a way to like, moderate the images that are being uploaded? If it's live on the internet, just keep that in mind if it's in your house. Yes, that is a very good point. Um, that is why the, um, number one, I did add a list of rules that you all had to agree to before you signed up for an account. I was very explicit about doing that. The other thing is that I have public signups disabled on this instance and will probably always have that on because I am, I trust you all, be cool. Um, uh, but um, yeah, I want to avoid a lot of that problem. That's a very good point. Another reason why you should not host public stuff from your house. But it's cool that you can. <laughs>